right, hello global people. Today we're going to do a video on the Industrial Revolution, and this is really going to set the stage for the next unit of imperialism. So please make sure you understand these concepts and ideas and people we will be talking about. And when we're talking about when we're talking about the Industrial Revolution, we need to figure out what it is exactly. And it is the introduction of factories and machine-made goods that began in England. So the big thing we're going to see here is no longer are people going to make things in their homes or their houses by hand. They're going to go to factories and make them using machines. So think about if you have a family member that knits and can make a scarf. It may take a long time for them to make a scarf by hand. But if they have a sewing machine, they can do it a lot faster. All right, how did it start? There were several factors that needed to be in place for the revolution to begin, including the following. There are three of them. You need to know all three of them very well. Natural resources are going to be very important for the Industrial Revolution to begin. Uh, they're going to allow goods to be made and factories to be run. And natural resources include water, coal, steel, iron, etc. And we'll see these turn into different finished products or used to run machines. We also have to have a large population. A large population is going to allow workers to work in factories. And finally, you're going to need lots of money. Entrepreneurs or business owners are going to need lots of money to build factories and produce these goods. Once we're talking about the Industrial Revolution, we're going to see lots of changes to daily life. And we're going to see this word called abundant. And what abundant means is a large amount. So how did the revolution benefit people? Goods became more abundant or larger in number and people can now afford them. So more goods are being produced and the prices of these goods are going to go down. How did the revolution change daily life? Well, it did so in many ways. It provided many jobs. However, life in the factory was not pleasant. Uh, you guys did a web quest on this. You looked at pictures. You're familiar with poor Timmy who would lose his arm and then Wendy would lose both of her arms. And this is just an example of what life would be like in a factory. Many individuals had to work as long as 12 to 16 hour days. They got very few breaks. If they were lucky, they would get a half hour, 45 minutes total over that time period. Um, they would be in very crowded factories and assembly lines as you can see in this picture. The working conditions were horrible and many people were injured on the job. Again, you would see lots of uh, injuries from machines being in tight spaces. Children often had to work sometimes as young as eight, nine years old, and they would often be used in mines. And you can see here that they are so small and they fit in tight spaces. And it's just a very, very dangerous time for children and workers. Other changes to life because of how dangerous these conditions were, unions began to form. And unions were a group of people with the same job that wanted better working conditions, more money, and shorter working hours. So a bunch of people at the factory would get together and they would join a union and they would say, we are going to negotiate on our behalf for better working conditions, more money, and shorter working hours. Also, after a while, the government steps in and helps fix some of the problems with industrialization by passing laws. So you see different child labor laws, factory acts that are passed to help improve the working conditions. And just keep in mind one thing that a union can do is they can go on strike when they refuse to work. And oftentimes they'll carry signs that's called picketing. So when union goes on strike, they pick it. And when your nose goes on strike, you, yeah, you pick it too. All right, some effects of the revolution. Just like the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution is going to see the size of the middle class growing. I can't stress this enough. The middle class is going to grow as a result of this. And the reason why is because many more people were working and earning more money than ever before. So you see that a lot in Regents exams. How is the Industrial Revolution similar to the French Revolution? Both of these saw a, an increase in the size of the middle class. And nations have become more interdependent on each other and have traded more. And this word interdependent, you'll see it a lot. What it means is that countries rely on each other. And here's a nice picture exemplifying this. You have the United States uh, and China, both of them together are gears. And if one of these gears breaks, it's going to affect the other one. So if something happens in China, it could affect the United States, especially with trade. That's an example of interdependence. Key people you must know during the Industrial Revolution. The first one is Adam Smith. And who was he? He was a capitalist that believed in laissez-faire economics. And what laissez-faire means is the government, there he is, would keep their hands off the economy. The government would not get involved or regulate business or the economy. In a perfect scenario, government does not own businesses. Businesses are owned by individuals. That is called private ownership. Any individual can pursue any business that they want. And go back to my dream of an ice cream shop, the Natty Scoop. If this were capitalism under Adam Smith, 
I would be the owner of the Natty Scoop and I would make most of the profits. And Adam Smith said that because I would be the one that is taking this risk, that is investing this money to succeed. Now, some key words to associate with Adam Smith. If you see these words on multiple choice questions, chances are they relate to Adam Smith. Private ownership and capitalism. Don't know what that piece is there for, but private ownership and capitalism uh, associate with Adam Smith. All right, the other guy we need to know is Karl Marx. And he, along with another gentleman by the name of Friedrich Engels, wrote a book, The Communist Manifesto. And he is all about being anti-capitalism. And he believed that the rich factory owners exploited the workers. And exploited is a very important term that you will see them to take advantage of or to abuse. So he believed that the rich factory owners took advantage of the workers or the poor people. And he called these workers or poor people the proletariat. He felt that the world was divided into two groups of people, the haves or the rich people and the have nots or the poor people. So in this picture, this guy is a have. He has all these goods. This guy is a have not. He has nothing. And he is, feels that these haves take advantage of the have nots. He also felt that workers should rebel and own the factories themselves where everyone would be equal. So one day under this scenario, I would go into my ice cream shop and all the workers would be waiting for me and they would start a revolution in this ice cream shop overthrow me, take over the, the ice cream shop themselves. I would no longer be the owner. They all would be equal owners and get all the money equally. So he would favor the workers owning the Natty Scoop. Karl Marx under communism favors the workers being equal and they own the factories or the means of production. Some key words to associate with Karl Marx, communism. Anytime you see communism, that's Karl Marx. This is his idea, that's his baby. Proletariat means the poor or the working class. Class struggle, he is all about class struggle, the fact that the rich take advantage or, or exploit the poor. And exploitation is another one as well. Okay, let's do a couple multiple choice practice questions for you to test your knowledge. When you take a multiple choice test or you encounter a multiple choice question, I want you to simply read the question first. Do not look at the answers, cover them up. So we're looking at what is a major result of the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Well, you know this from learning this, that a major result are a couple different things. One, the size of the middle class grew. You also know that new goods became more abundant or larger in number and prices of goods became more cheap as well. So let's try to find the, that answer that matches up to what we just thought. An increase in the size and influence of the middle class. Absolutely, that fits in. That very well could be the answer, but let's keep going on to make sure. An increase in the percentage of people engaged in farming. No, we know that's incorrect because people are moving away from farms and going into the cities. And growing of cities, when cities increase in size, that's called urbanization. A decrease in life expectancy and an increased infant mortality. No, children weren't dying more. Actually, what we see here is life expectancy is increasing at the time because of medicine and medical advancements. Even though there were factory accidents, uh, life expectancy generally did increase. People were eating more as well. A reliance on subsistence economy. Subsistence means you simply provide or grow enough for yourself and you're not selling goods to anyone else. That is not true whatsoever. So we know the answer clearly here is number one. The size and influence of the middle class grows just like after the French Revolution. Question number two. In his writings, Karl Marx maintained that history is primarily, okay, Karl Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto, anti-capitalism, didn't like the rich, thought that the rich exploited or took advantage of the poor. That's what I think when I see Karl Marx in his writings. Let's try to match that answer up. One, a compromise between rulers and the rule. An ongoing class conflict between the rich and the poor. Yeah, that sounds pretty correct. Uh, definitely, that he believed that the world was divided into two groups of people, the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots. That could be the answer. We're going to keep going, though. A long struggle by groups to achieve representative democracy. It's not really talking about democracy at all. See, he's more focused on workers taking over and everybody being equal. A religious conflict between Eastern and Western groups. Karl Marx definitely was not uh, really concerned about religion. He was not in favor of religion very much. So the clear answer here is number two, an ongoing class conflict between the rich and the poor. All right, my guys, you have two other questions I would like you to practice. Be prepared to go over them in class. Um, if you have any questions, email me. Thank you for watching this video, and hopefully you learn more about the Industrial Revolution. Have a good day.